So with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker this evening. Uh, Professor Samir Singh is going to talk about explaining black box machine learning predictions. Uh, he's an assistant uh, professor of computer science at uh, UCI in the ICS department, uh, arriving uh, just last year, so he's a relatively uh, new faculty member here. His research focuses on large-scale and interpretable machine learning applied to information extraction and natural language processing, which we'll hear more about tonight. tonight. He did postdoc research work at the University of Washington, and prior to that, he earned his PhD at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And he's also uh, worked at a variety of places, including Microsoft Research, Google Research, and Yahoo Labs, all focusing on massive scale machine learning. He is the uh, recipient of a number of awards, including uh, the Adobe Research Data Science Faculty Award, the DARPA Riser Award, the uh, Grand Prize in Yelp Dataset Award, and um, the Yahoo Key Scientific Challenges Fellowship. And of he's published numerous publications and given many presentations at uh, top tier machine learning and natural language conferences and workshops. So with that, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Professor Samir Singh. Cool. Thanks, Dan. Oh, uh, the clicker. Yes. Oh, great. Uh, <laughs> this is not a slide. It's, it's an actual <laughs> I should make that my first slide, actually. That's, a, that's just too. Ah, there we go. Cool. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about what I've been doing towards explaining black box machine learning predictions. Uh, I want to mention that this work was started at University of Washington with Marco and Carlos, who are mentioned there. OK. Um, I usually have this slide talking about how machine learning is everywhere. Um, but does everybody know that machine learning is everywhere? Is there anyone who doesn't realize that? OK, great. So we can just sort of skip this. Um, it's in our emails. It's in our searches. It's playing games for us better than we can. It's telling us what we should be doing with our time now that games aren't fun anymore. Um, it's in our phones. It's in our houses. And soon, it's going to be in our cars. It is basically everywhere, right? Now, one of the questions that comes up is, you know, why does it work? And what does it actually do? And what is machine learning? So just to give you sort of a quick example of what machine learning can do for you, suppose you want to adopt an animal that you find outside your house that looks like this. Now the question is, well, is this a wolf? Or is this a particular breed of a dog that looks like a wolf? Should I adopt it or not? Um, you can create a machine learning model that basically takes this image as a photograph and gives you a prediction for what it thinks is in the image. So in this case, it turns out this is a wolf, and you're better off not adopt, adopting it. It might be illegal to adopt it, actually. Um, on the other hand, if you have an image like this, you, you should be able to, the machine learning model should be able to look at it and say, hey, this is a husky. It's a particular breed of a dog. It's OK to, to adopt it. Right? Um, this seems like a simple example, but this is, this, this is called classification, and it's sort of core to machine learning and to what it can do. Um, and you might think, well, this does look like a pretty difficult task. I mean, humans can't do it easily. How does it take months to set this up? And actually, no. You can implement all of this stuff, use online resources, and have it basically done in a couple of hours. So this is what my, the student who was working on this did, Marco. He created this classifier that could differentiate between wolves and huskies, and it was really accurate. So these are some example outputs. Um, and as you can see, at least in these six images, it only makes one mistake, right? And this is, I think, much better than what I would do. I don't want to claim anything about other people. But yeah, I wouldn't be able to dis distinguish uh, these two things with so much accuracy. Um, so this is kind of encouraging. It seems like machine learning is doing something smart. Um, 
but it sort of goes beyond classification. So here's an example of a more recent machine learning task that the researchers have been looking at. It hasn't quite made its way to a product yet, um, but the idea is that now you want to do some kind of question answering about a specific image. So this is called visual question answering, where you're given an image, even if it's a really strange image of a woman, and this is strange in many ways, including the fact that she seems to be above seven feet tall. Um, but you give this image to a machine learning algorithm, and you phrase any sort of free text question, like, is there a mustache in this picture? And the machine learning models, the state-of-the-art ones, are able to come back and say yes. Right? This is not anything like a mustache they've seen before, but they're able to say that this is a mustache. And you might say, well, it's a 50-50% chance of them getting it right, but actually this task is a little bit more complex. You can also ask it, what is the mustache made of? And the machine learning algorithm actually comes back and says bananas. Right. Now this is really, really impressive. It seems to, not only is the machine learning algorithm understanding the image and the question, but it's also able to understand what an abstract notion of a mustache is. Mustache isn't always just hair, it can be a banana in, in this case. Right? Now the problem is that the underlying machine learning models are incredibly complicated, uh, not just mathematically, but just in terms of the structure and the number of parameters and everything that's involved, which basically means that we don't know whether we can actually trust the algorithms or not, right? We can never know whether the predictions are always going to be correct or even if they're gonna be correct with a certain accuracy. But more sort of importantly, we don't really know how to predict what such a machine learning algorithm would do. It's, it sometimes seems to be doing reasonable things, but actually it might be doing something completely different. And in fact, if you're a machine learning practitioner, like either a researcher or in a software company, and you want to use machine learning, it's very difficult to figure out how to even improve it, because all you have is a few predictions. You don't really know what's going on, right? So going back to this example, I showed you that uh, this was a, only making one mistake, and we were all pretty impressed uh, with this, this result. But turns out that there was something actually very different that was going on. And in fact, what we had created here was a snow detector. What that meant was, uh, if it saw snow on the ground, it predicted wolf. And if it didn't see snow on the ground, it predicted it was a husky. Right? Not as smart as what we thought it was doing. Um, <laughs> seems to be working out for these examples. You can also now see why that specific example fails, because it, there happens to be some snow in an image of a husky, right? And there is no easy way to know that this is actually what the classifier is doing. Um, but this, you can say, hey, your student implemented this in a couple of hours. This can't be the whole story. Um, well, if you actually use that classifier, things like these happen. Um, <laughs> This is a true story, but not of someone who used a classifier. But, yeah. um, okay. but we can also look at the state of the art sort of machine learning algorithms that we really like. And because the researchers don't really have insights to what is going on, um, they can sort of be a little misled. Um, so for example, we were pretty happy with this result. What is the mustache made of? It said banana. That seems quite, quite cool. Um, Turns out, if you ask it, what are the eyes made of, which is what something we just typed, um, it said bananas. <laughs> that kind of disappointed us. Okay, so eyes are clearly not made of bananas. You can't even, I tried to picture the bananas as eyes, but I couldn't. There's no even abstract notion of eyes here. Um, but then we thought, okay, let's go simpler. Let's just say what, um, and it said bananas. <laughs> We said, what is, and it said, banana. <laughs> exactly. So you, suddenly we realize, OK, it, it is at least detecting that the yellow curved surfaces are bananas, uh, which is it's just not, not trivial for a software to do that. But it's not completely doing what we thought it was doing. And it's easy for us to attribute intelligence to these things and go super, get super excited without actually knowing what they're doing. 
Uh, so I'm going to give you a few more examples of where this happens sort of in, in some of the examples that we've come across. Um, this is an example of text classification. The task here is that you're given an email. Um, it happens to be from Keith Richards, not the Keith Richards uh, I'm familiar with. But, but this email is clearly about Christianity, right? It's saying it's sort of a propaganda email. Um, clearly, there's no doubt about it. But when we sent this to a classifier that tried to predict whether an email was about Christianity or about atheism, um, it predicted that this email was about atheism with a really high probability. It thought 82% chances are that this email is about atheism. Now, you would think that this classifier is a bad classifier. And turns out it's not. It's actually the state-of-the-art classifier for this data set. These are what people have been publishing on. And that really uh, disappointed us because this is, there's no ambiguity in this email. It's not like a difficult email and, oh, how will machine learning figure it out? It's clearly the answer. And then if you ask the question, well, why did this happen? Why is the machine learning algorithm doing this? Um, there is no real answer that you can just sort of looking at this example give me, right? Um, and that, that's kind of the problem here. We don't know with the black box what's actually going on. Right. Here's an example which is somewhat made up. Um, suppose you're applying for a loan, and this is a black box machine learning world, which is kind of what it is right now. Um, usually what you do is you give some of your information to this machine learning algorithm. Most likely the company already has, knows everything about you. They know your Facebook, they know your blah, blah, blah. They'll use all that, and they might tell you that your request has been denied, uh, which you know can happen. But the problem now happens is when you ask, try to ask the machine learning algorithm why my particular application was apply, uh, rejected. What is it that, that led you to believe it? Uh, unfortunately, right now, all machine learning algorithms can do is throw a bunch of numbers and said, hey, these are the numbers we used to do my computation. Um, that, that's all I have for you, right? And obviously, from a user perspective or from anybody's perspective, this is not an ideal situation, right? And this, up here, this happens in any application of machine learning. Right? So before I talk about what my research is in trying to sort of address these concerns, it's kind of important to look a little bit back in time and see how did we end up here. Um, it seems like a pretty bad place to be in. Uh, seems like we should have thought of this earlier. Uh, so just to give a little bit more context of what's actually going on, right? And this will also include some background on machine learning. So um, yeah, hopefully that's, that it won't be too technical, right? So in a cartoon sort of higher level way, uh, the best way to describe machine learning is that you already have some historical input data and some historical output data. What the input and the output data looks like is dependent on your application. It could be images of wolves and huskies as input and as output, whether it's a wolf or a husky. In loan applications, it could be previous applications and whether they were successful or not. You throw all of this into a machine learning algorithm and it spits out a classifier, which is inherently some complex math that it does. And what this classifier is able to do is take any new input that it hasn't seen before, and it's able to predict what the output on this, this unseen instance would be. Right? So this is sort of what the higher level picture of machine learning looks like. So we're going to be focusing a little bit more on the green box here, a little bit more on what the classifier is actually doing. And how do we actually learn this, this classifier? So suppose um, this is a scenario where somebody comes to you and says, hey, Samir, um, can you loan me some money? Um, if I know nothing about the person, I'm probably not going to give them a loan. So I'm going to ask them to give me some details about themselves, which might be something like, what their income is, and how much they've been saving up last couple of months. Right? That gives me some more information about this person, but unless I've been lending out money before, it's not enough. You, you kind of need more to figure out whether to give this person a loan or not. So what people do is sort of get historical data. 
They go ask their friends and they say, hey, have you been giving out loans? What happens? And get a bunch of data points. All these data points, each of them has a specific income and a specific savings that that person has done. And the red indicates that the loan didn't turn out to be a good thing. The person defaulted or something like that. And the blue means that you know uh, the person came back with the loan. Right? So what machine learning does with this data is tries to figure out whether for this blue cross, we should give them a loan or not. In this specific case, uh, it seems like we should be using a linear classifier. What that means is we should be treating that as a good loan case based on the intuition that a line pretty cleanly divides the negatives and the positives, right? So what this linear sort of equation ends up becoming our classifier. Now that's not a very complex equation. In fact, you can write it out pretty easily in, in sort of if-then kind of way. Um, and what is important is not only the fact that you, know, you can write it out, you can actually understand what's happening. Um, you can sort of interpret what this classifier is doing. We can see based on the coefficients of this classifier that both incomes and savings have a positive effect. So if you want to increase your chances of getting a loan, you should increase your income or you should start saving more or both. And in fact, it also seems to be saying that X1, which is savings, seems to be more important than income in this specific situation. Right? So, so we kind of understand what's going on here. Uh, but data is not as simple as just taking a line and dividing it. Uh, it can get a little bit more complicated like this, in which case what you do is some kind of nested splitting. So in this case also, you would probably give this person a loan based on the intuition that you can divide it into multiple regions and the region that is blue tends to look positive and you have used multiple lines to divide this up. Right? Now multiple lines is sometimes more complicated than a single line, but in this case, you can sort of write it out as a simple flowchart. You can say, hey, is X1 greater than 0.5? If not, then just reject. If it is, then look at X2 and try to make your decision that way. Now, compared to lines, this is also really interpretable, which is quite nice. You know that x2 becomes irrelevant if x1 is uh, less than 0.5, and if x1 is greater than 0.5, then x2 is enough to make the decision, right? You kind of know what's going on once you've done the learning, right? So, the, the point I want to make here is that we are able to look at the structure of these classifiers and we are able to look at what it's going to do, which means we know whether we should trust it or not. Basically, by looking at the structure, we can see, oh, does this match our intuitions or not? And if it does, then we know it's doing something intelligent or something reasonable. We are also able to predict what it's going to do, what kind of mistakes it's going to make, because we can look at the structure and we know exactly what's going on. Similarly, we know whether to, how do we improve this um, machine learning model? Because the structure kind of tells you what the machine learning model is, you can sort of look at it directly and say, okay, this part of the structure is wrong, and we should sort of get data to address that aspect. Okay, um, but then the story kind of changed maybe a decade ago or more. Uh, with the arrival of big data, right? Now again, most of you are familiar with what big data is, but just to sort of put things in uh, perspective, big data just really exploded the number of applications machine learning had. Uh, so now big data is basically everywhere. You know, whether you think about language and sort of text and all of these things, big data is used a lot. In economics, you have big data stuff going on. Biomedicine is a huge application. Mm -hmm. You have big data in banking, big data in retail, uh, in digital humanities, and in biology, and, and so on, right? So you have all of these applications of big data that suddenly want to use machine learning. Um, now the question is, how does that affect machine learning models, and how does it affect what we are doing? Uh, in fact, it affects us in two different ways. One of the ways it affects us is that our classifiers now cannot be simple anymore. What that means is that we had this line that was dividing positives and negatives in these two dimensions, 
that's actually not expressive enough. In fact, even if you look at multiple regions, that's also not effective enough. What you need are really, really complex curves which look more like this, right? And this is something just we drew uh, as a curve, and you might be like, well, no, actual curves probably don't look this complicated. But just to think, think about this curve, what this means is that there is no single sentence or a single paragraph that I can use to describe what this is doing, right? And from a computer science of point of view, if we want to write a program that captures what this is doing, it's an incredibly complex program that we can't easily read and understand, right? Uh, this is not really a cartoon, actually. So this is a figure from McKinsey uh, that they released. It's very similar to what I was showing earlier. There are two drivers, is what they call them. They don't want us to know what the drivers are. Um, and the green thick line that you see is sort of a simple curve that they used to use earlier. That's sort of the traditional machine learning or statistical models. That's what it would do. And the rest of the sort of curves and the bumps that you see, those are the risk analysis that comes out of a really complex machine learning algorithm. It also comes out of the data um, that sort of captures what's going on. And so you can see that the surface is complex enough that you can't really imagine a simple way of cutting it into pieces. And in fact, if you try to cut it into pieces, there'll be so many equations involved that to explain what's going on will be next to impossible. Or to understand why something is going on is, is quite difficult. Right. But this was one of the problems. Um, the other problems is that the number of dimensions is not just two. It was never really two. It was always tens or hundreds. But in general, you're looking at a lot more dimensionality of the data as well. So in the loan application case, for example, you're not just looking at the income or the savings, but you're looking at a bunch of other things. You're looking at how much loan they are asking for, you're looking at what their profession is, what their age is, whether they're married or not, um, you're looking at their credit scores, you're looking at their historical sort of financial history of how many defaults that they do in the past, uh, you're looking at not just the total history, but some kind of recent defaults in the past one year, and so on. And what this means is that the number of dimensions that you're looking at, which were just two, we were looking at that curved surface in a two-dimensional space, which we could understand, um, easily goes into hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands, millions, and actually many, many more than that, right? People are looking at um, hundreds of millions dimensions when it comes to many of these things, right? So now imagine what we have as the situation, right? We have these complex curves that are complex enough in two dimensions as it is. We can't really understand what's happening more than three dimensions anyway. But we're talking about now you know, having this curve be really, really complex in lots and lots of dimensions. Right? And this has basically resulted in us, all these machine learning algorithms becoming black boxes. The underlying representation is too complicated, and the number of dimensions are too, too huge for us to understand what's happening. So a different way to look at it as to why we sort of got here is to think about the accuracy of a model as the y-axis and how interpretable it is as the sort of x-axis. And the model that I sort of described earlier, the simple equations and the sort of flow charts, they end up being really, really interpretable, but they're not accurate for what we want at all. And you can sort of make these systems more complicated, and that gets them to be a little bit more accurate, but never really as accurate as you need them to be. But even if they were getting there, they, they're losing interpretability, right? So that spider web kind of thing that I'm showing you there is an example of that same flow chart when it gets really complicated. Now, it's still a flow chart, so in theory, you can look at parts of it and see what's going on, but it's a really, really complicated. It's a really, really big structure, and you wouldn't be able to understand what the, what's going on anyway. Right? Uh, there has been a lot of research on interpretable models, and I kind of want to mention them here, which try to address the interpretability angle while at the same time retaining accuracy. And I think there's a lot of cool stuff that happened there. 
uh, but they were never really as useful as we would like them to be. Right, so in the real world, we care about really accurate machine learning models, and they never really got there. Um, and so when this was kind of the situation, deep learning came in as, as a solution, and deep learning sort of involves any complicated machine learning model. And in this case, you know, they decided to focus only on accuracy. They decided to create machine learning algorithms that could be as accurate as possible, without worrying about the interpretability part because that was clearly sort of holding us back. Um, and in fact, the, these methods have been amazing. They were actually on many tasks are better than humans. Um, but in general, they are really, really accurate and they're being deployed everywhere on our cell phones, on our cars, and so on, right? Okay, so now that you guys have a good idea of what the situation is, let's start talking about uh, where our stuff comes in, right? So I told you all this, looking at the structure gives you all of this benefit, but it only works if the structure is simple. The structures are not simple anymore. We don't know whether we trust machine learning algorithms. We don't know how to predict what they will do, and we don't know how to improve them. Um, and so with that, we're gonna start talking about how do we explain predictions and specifically the Lime algorithm that we introduced last year. Okay. So here's the loan application situation, um, just sort of revisited with color now. Um, so the person is applying for a loan, again, and gives all the information, and the request gets denied, and the user might have a question as to why the loan application was denied. And what we want to provide is an explanation that sort of breaks down the decision in terms of what you submitted, right? So in this case, a machine learning classifier, which is clearly the wrong one, um, <laughs> decides to reject the loan application using, uh, the decision is based 35% on the race, 20% on the income, and 20, 15% on the savings, right? Now clearly this is a bad machine learning algorithm and this user should go to court and blah, 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 right? Um, but we want to be able to provide some sort of justification like this, right? Um, and in, in order to do so, you might remember that, you know, you can look at the structure to figure out what's going on, but the structures are so complicated. And in fact, what we are trying to do is uh, sort of explain what's happening by being completely agnostic to what the structure of the machine learning model is. In fact, we're gonna be treating the machine learning classifier as a black box, right? Because that's basically what it is. It's so complicated that it is a black box for all practical purposes, right? Now, one of the reasons to be able to do this is to be able to explain what any machine learning algorithm is doing, not only any existing machine learning algorithm, but in fact, any future machine learning algorithm as well. As far as we're concerned, it's a black box, so it doesn't really matter what the underlying uh, model is, right? But what is important is we want to explain why a specific decision was made. So why was this cross uh, a negative decision? And that's what we're gonna be focusing on. Right. Uh, so going back to this picture, I showed you there a bunch of methods, a sort of trade off accuracy versus interpretability. What the Lime algorithm is trying to do is take any of these methods it's not trying to add new points to this graph. We're not proposing a new model that trades off accuracy and interpretability. What we're proposing is we take any of these existing algorithms, treat them as black boxes, but still try to explain why they're making the decisions that they're making, right? So to take any of these algorithms that are currently uninterpretable, make them as interpretable as possible without uh, sacrificing their accuracy at all. Okay, so what does an explanation look like? Before I go into the, the sort of our idea and how it works, it's useful to look at a concrete explanation. Um, so this was an example of text classification where we thought this email was um, about atheism, but clearly it should be about Christianity and we wanted to know why it happened. What an explanation looks like in this situation is we basically create two columns, one for atheism and one for Christianity and we want to assign uh, to each word which of these categories is it contributing towards, right? 
So for example, if you look at what's the most informative word here, the machine learning model seems to think that Christianity is the most important word, and it thinks that the Christianity is indicative of Christian, uh, this email being Christian, right? So far, so good. This is what we expected to do. Um, but the overall prediction is still atheism. So we start looking at more words uh, that the machine learning model found useful. And we see that the word posting that appears in the header seems to be indicative of atheism as far as the machine learning model is concerned. Now this is kind of disappointing because that just is sort of technical jargon that appears in email headers. It's not, shouldn't really be the signal that we're using. Um, but if you look at the next important word, it ends up being host. That's also something that shouldn't be taken into account. And after that, you know, the name Keith seems to be also indicative of atheism. Um, maybe there is a correlation. I don't know where the names come from in this case. But, but clearly, it's not the point of the exercise, right? We were looking at emails, and we wanted to know from the text somehow whether it was about Christianity or atheism. But just because we had this extra data in, the, in our files, um, the machine learning model is completely relying on that for this example. Um, there are a couple of less useful words like is and answer that with a very small weight seem to be contributing. Right? Now what this tells you is that maybe we should remove the, the header information. right? We should remove where the email was from. We should remove all of this technical uh, header information and give this retrain the machine learning classifier, sort of telling us what the problem is and a way to fix it as well. Right. Um, so now let's talk about how we can actually do this. I told you that the black box classifiers are these really complicated surfaces or millions of dimensions. Uh, and now we are suddenly saying that we are trying to provide an explanation. How can we even do that? The main idea we had here is not to try and explain the whole surface. So the whole curved surface is really complicated. We're not going to try and explain what's going on everywhere. But for a specific data point, see where that data point resides in this global surface and sort of only look at what's happening relevant to that data point. What that means is that the whole surface actually doesn't matter. What matters is a lot more zoomed in version of the curved surface. And in fact, we can zoom in a lot more till we feel what looks like um, the class, the, what the classifier looks like is something that we can understand. What I mean by understanding here is that we can replace the classifier with a line, and that would be a really accurate representation of what the classifier is doing in the locality of the decision we want to make. Right? So that's kind of the intuition, is to use some kind of interpretable model to describe a very local behavior of what the classifier is doing. And that way we get an explanation for why a specific decision was made and what the classifier kind of cares about. Um, again, we do this in a completely black box manner. So I'll give you an example of how this works for image classification. Um, here's an image of a dog playing a guitar, as they tend to do. Um, and we want to explain why this image was tagged as a dog by a classifier. The classifier we use here is Google's Inception Net classifier for those who know. Um, but, but the main idea is that Google has released this API where you can submit your images and it tells you what's in the image. That's basically completely black box as far as you're concerned. And that's the sort of interface we also use when we try to explain these classifiers, right? Um, so we're going to be able to explain what the classifier is doing without necessarily having the access to their code or anything. So what we do uh, to explain is take this image, which has a probability of 2, 1 as Labrador, and create many different versions of this image, which are perturbed in many random ways, right? So here's an example of what a perturbed image would look like. We are sort of masking out parts of the image, completely on random. Um, and we send this fake image to the classifier and see what the probability of the dog is according to the classifier. 
In this case, it becomes 92%. We create another perturbation, send it again to the Google server, and get, get back what the Google's neural network thinks the probability of the dog is. And we do this a third time, and in fact, we do this tens of thousands of times, if not hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of times. For a single image, we just create many, many, many perturbations, keep sending it to the server, and seeing what the prediction is. Now, given this uh, sort of response from the black box classifier, we are able to do some analysis on top of this data to basically figure out which parts of the image were useful for the classifier. And that's what the explanation ends up looking like. The way to look at this explanation is to say that the face of the dog is something the Google's classifier is looking at, and also some part, I think, I think it's part of the leg of the dog that the classifier is looking at to predict that this is a dog. And as far as the classifier is concerned, the rest of the image matters much, much less. In fact, it may not matter at all, uh, depending on how you set up the search. Right. So um, this is yeah. So this is what you can do with these kind of explanations. So I showed you this image, and I showed you what a Labrador looks like. Turns out the Google's classifier actually thinks that there is an acoustic guitar also in this image. And we can figure out why it thinks there's an acoustic guitar. Turns out it's actually looking at the body of the guitar, but also for some reason part of the dog's uh, sort of face and, and shirt um, to decide that this is an acoustic guitar. Um, it also thinks it's an electric guitar with actually the highest probability. And in order to think it's an electric guitar, it's focusing mostly on the neck of the guitar, which kind of makes sense because electric and acoustic guitar necks kind of look the same. Uh, but it's also looking at the hand position, and the hand position might indicate it's more likely to be electric guitar or not. But that's at least that's what the neural network is doing, and we can do that all using this black box assumption. Okay. Let's go back to this example of wolves versus huskies, if you guys still remember. We were making only one mistake, but I kind of told you that it was doing a snow detector kind of thing. We had set it up that way. Um, but in fact, if you look at the explanations, which look like this, a lot of it starts making sense. Um, let's just look at the one where we predict, where the classifier predicts it to be a wolf. As you will see in the explanations for each of these four images, the classifier is completely ignoring where the wolf should actually be. Right? It's completely grayed out, which means that the neural network is not even looking at the, the animal. All it's focusing on is sort of the white patches in the image, right? what, what's on the ground, basically. Um, and if it sees that it's white, it doesn't matter what's in the rest of the image. It matters much less what's in the rest of the image. It predicts it to be a wolf. OK, and based on this intuition, now someone who doesn't know machine learning, someone who doesn't know the sort of tricks we did, can still say, oh, OK, you, all you guys have done is built a great snow detector, but it's actually not solving the problem that you wanted to solve. Here's another example that we talked about earlier, this question of you know, whether there's a banana in this, whether the mustache is made of banana or not. Uh, here also we can provide explanations for why the machine learning model thinks there's a banana. But in this case, we are focusing more on the question. Right? So what we are saying is, what about the question was taken into account when the machine learning model said banana? And from our example and from the fact that it's bold there, you guys can probably guess that what matters to the machine learning algorithm for this specific instance is that the question starts with a what. Right? If the question starts with a what, and you know there's a certain structure to the question, it always gives the answer a banana. So here are a couple of just completely random questions that are system generated for which the answer by the machine learning algorithm is always banana even if that's not the right sort of answer. We can look at a different question, like how many, how many bananas are in the picture. And it says two, which is the correct answer. But it's actually only focusing on the word many. Uh -huh. 
So again, you can create a bunch of random questions where the word many exists, and the machine learning algorithm is just going to give you the answer too. Including stuff like how many people are in the picture, it will say two, because it's actually ignoring that the, the, the fact that you're asking about people and not about bananas, it's still going to give you two. Right? So these two examples were sort of um, cases where machine learning algorithm wasn't being as smart as we wanted it to be. Um, I'm going to give you an example where the machine learning is actually doing a really nice job. This is the task of neural uh, machine translation, where you're given a sentence in English, which is, this is the question we must address, um, and you want to translate it into Portuguese, which is the translation there that I'm not even going to try and pronounce. Um, now, the question becomes, okay, why does this specific translation, why did this specific translation take place? The way to rephrase this question is you can look at any specific word in Portuguese, like the word esta here, and you can ask why is this word in the translation? What about the source sentence? What about the English sentence makes you think that this sentence should start with esta? Now, if you know Portuguese or Spanish, I guess, um, you would know that what esta means is the literal translation is this is. And so English part should only be focusing on this is, and it should use that to say esta. But in the explanation, we realized that it's also focusing on the word question. Uh, and initially, that kind of confused me. But when I started talking to someone who knew Portuguese, it turns out esta is the female form of this is. And question is a feminine noun in Portuguese. And so the reason esta appears in Portuguese is because in English sentence, we are saying this is the question. In fact, if we were using a different word, something like this is the problem, then we wouldn't be using esta. We would be using este. Right? And so what this tells us is that this neural network is learning what the genders of individual words are. And it's using these genders to tell us which word to use in Portuguese. Right? And just to sort of complete this, you can also say this is what we must address. In which case, it's neither esta or este, but it's a different word, ASO. And ESO there exists because of this is what in the source sentence, right? No one or two word tells us that the word should be ESO. It's all of them together that translate into ESO. Right? So this is a slightly complicated example, but even for this sort of complicated case, our explanations are really useful in trying to understand what these complicated systems are doing. Right? Um, here are a few more examples. Uh, this is a simpler one where we are talking about salary prediction, trying to predict whether someone has a high salary or not. In this case, for this particular user, we predict that he has a salary less than 50K. Um, and our explanation is going to tell you exactly why we think so. And our explanation ends up looking like a simple if-then condition. It says something like, if education is equal to or less than equal to high school, so if you've only graduated high school at max, uh, then I'm going to predict that the salary is low. Right? This is just what the machine learning model is doing. We are able to do that because of our explanation technique, even though it was a complicated black box classifier. Right? We are able to simplify exactly the part that it's looking at. Here's another example along those lines. You're trying to predict a high salary for this specific individual. In this case, the explanation is a little bit more complicated. The machine learning model here seems to think that if you're married and you have a doctorate, then your salary is pretty high. And again, if you know enough about the census and people, you can come in and say, OK, I agree with this or disagree with this. But at least you have a way to understand and communicate with machine learning models now. OK. So one last thing I want to mention about our approach is the fact that we are explaining individual decisions. Right? I showed you that there's a red cross, and we are only drawing a line to explain what's happening. The important question ends up being what's happening for the rest of the curve. Right? What is the classifier actually doing beyond just a single decision? Um, 
And that's a really important question because what we're doing is just drawing one of these lines. But our solution, or our proposed solution for now, is to not just provide a single example, um, but to give a bunch of explanations that cover the whole picture, right? So obviously we can't expect the user to look at every possible explanation because the data sets are so huge. So we are going to select which explanations to show to you if you want to understand what the whole curve looks like. In this specific example, what that means is we are going to select these sort of nine or 10 examples that we think are indicative of what the classifier is doing globally. And we want to do this again still in a black box manner. Uh, the way we select these explanations, again, I won't go into the technical details, but the main idea is that they should be as representative of the whole curve as possible. So all of those black points are good points to have, but also they should be diverse. Uh, so in the, in the figure right now, both black and green shouldn't be uh, in the set because they are too similar to each other. If you already have black in your set, you should pick the red one because it's very different from the each other, right? So our solution to understanding the whole curve is to give you a set number of explanations. Okay, so so far what I've done is shown you a bunch of pictures that seem to suggest that, hey, these explanations seem to be giving us insights into what these machine learning models are doing. Uh, but we really believe in the science part of computer science. It's not just engineering these explanations. It's also making sure that they're actually useful through experimental studies. So to that end, we have uh, designed sort of quantitative evaluation with humans in the loop in trying to understand whether these explanations are actually useful um, or not, right? Um, and there are four different sort of setups that we have. We want to know whether we whether users can understand what machine learning is doing with these explanations. We want to know whether they can compare different machine learning algorithms, even if they don't know any machine learning, using these explanations. Um, can we use these explanations to improve the model? And finally, can we use um, these explanations to predict what the model is going to do in the future? Right? So I'm gonna quickly go through each of these experiments to sort of show you a brief flavor of what kind of evaluations you can do uh, with, with these kind of setups, right? So let's first look at whether people understand what the machine learning classifier is doing by looking at the explanations, right? Now this goes back to our setup of wolves versus huskies where we had this classifier that was basically detecting snow. What we did was we showed all of these predictions to a user uh, with explanations and without explanations. Um, and we asked them a bunch of questions, right? First question we asked them is, would you trust this model, right? So if you had to use this to differentiate between a wolf and a uh, dog, would you trust this? Um, and the second question we asked them was, well, what is the classifier doing? Just write a paragraph of text, sort of justifying what you think the classifier is doing. Um, and the question is, did they notice this weird thing about the snow detecting part, which we didn't tell them was happening? Um, so here are sort of the proportion of people who answered sort of the right way. Uh, if you think about how many people did not trust the model before the explanations, it was actually about 60%. 60% uh, of them said that we don't trust what's happening. The students, well, the people here were students in machine learning courses, so they are sort of um, already a bit uh, disillusioned and they tend not to trust machine learning models, which is why this, this number is high. But what is more important is that very few of them had anything to say about snow or insight when we asked them what the classifier is doing before we showed them the explanations. But once we showed them the explanations, a lot more of them stopped trusting the machine learning model, which is good because um, it's clearly not doing the right thing. There were still a few people who seemed to trust it, which um, I guess they're pretty naive, so yeah. Uh, and, but what is really, really cool is that almost all of them, in this case, I think there were two people who missed out, um, completely got the snow inside, completely realized that you were using snow to differentiate between the wolf and a husky. Um, 
without knowing anything about the underlying machine learning algorithm or where, what it was trained on or anything like that. Right. Okay. The second sort of evaluation we did was to see whether mechanical Turk people, like completely lay people, not experts in machine learning, can they help us figure out which machine learning model is better than the other one, right? So the setup here is that we had a single classifier, and this is something that's true in most applications of machine learning. You have some classifier that you start off with, and you make some change to it, you know, whether it could be the underlying model, it could be the training data, it could be any of these uh, things, and you end up with a second classifier. And now the question is, which one is actually better? Um, a lot of people rely on accuracy, and it turns out that's a really not a useful thing all the time. Some of the examples I showed you earlier sort of get at that. Um, but what a lot of people end up doing is just look at output examples and then decide based on those whether um, they like one classifier or the other. Often companies tend to deploy both of these classifiers in parallel and just run real-time sort of evaluation. And that's the right thing to do, but it's really expensive and time-consuming. And unfortunately, a lot of people just kind of go by their gut feeling. Like, so the change that I have made is, I think, the mathematically the right thing to do. Therefore, it must be better, something like that. And we just wanted to see whether explanations can give us a different way of evaluating which classifier might be better. So this is the setup we had here. We showed the user the original image, and then we would show them an explanation that looks like this. Um, this explanation is clearly ignoring most of the wolf, and then we also show them a second explanation of the different classifier, and say that this is what the second classifier is doing, and in this case, you will realize that, okay, the classifier is actually looking at the wolf, which is a positive to start with, but it also seems to be looking at the snout, it's looking at the eyes, it's looking at the ears and the fur on the back and things like that. And so based on these explanations, even without knowing any machine learning, you can sort of say that this is a bad classifier and this is a good classifier, right? Or at least comparatively, the second one is doing better on this image than the first one. It's doing a more reasonable job. Um, you can also do the same with text classification, the email classification that I had earlier. This is an example of what a bad explanation looks like or what an explanation for a bad classifier looks like. And you can look at this explanation and you can say, okay, something weird is going on. We probably shouldn't trust it if it thinks all Keats are atheists. That's probably not the best way to go. Um, here's a different explanation for a different classifier. Uh, the colors are kind of different, but the purple means atheism and green means Christianity. And you can see that this one seems to be picking up on very useful sort of words. It thinks atheists talk about morality all the time. Christians talk about Christians all the time. Um, it's especially interesting that both of them talk about God all the time, but Christians tend to use the uppercase G when referring to God, while atheists use lowercase g. Right? And so when you look at an explanation like this, what you should think about it is, okay, it seems to be doing something much more reasonable than what the other classifier is doing, so this must be a better classifier. Right? So this is exactly the sort of interface we had for Mechanical Turk people, and for people who are not familiar with Mechanical Turk, it's just this service that Amazon provides where you can ask people all over the world to do tasks for you. Right? So these are people who just in their free time do this thing, and they're not machine learning experts, they're not computer scientists, uh, they're usually not highly educated people, otherwise they wouldn't be doing this, right? And, and we give them these two explanations, so for each example, we give them an explanation, we ask them to look at a bunch of examples, and then we ask them which algorithm, one or two, do you think is doing a better job, or do you think is doing a more reasonable job of, of the task, right? Um, and this is the results that we get. If you were completely random in guessing which classifier is better, you would do 50% of the time you would get it right. 
if you just show them a random set of explanations, even that is incredibly useful. You get up to 75% of the time, users are able to tell which classifier is better. But if you actually do our clever way of selecting which explanations to show them, it's almost 90%, right? So to put this in perspective, 89% of these Mechanical Turk users are able to tell us which is the more trustworthy machine learning model without knowing any machine learning. Right. Okay. Um, I'm going to quickly go through the last two sort of evaluations. They're a little bit more involved, um, but it'll still give you a picture of why this is useful. So sometimes you want people to help you improve your classifier. You have an existing machine learning algorithm. You know it might be making mistakes, but you want people to help improve it. And so this is the setup we did, where we generated a bunch of explanations, gave it to, again, to Mechanical Turk people, and then asked them to suggest changes uh, to, to these models. And then we evaluated whether our classifier is actually getting better or not. Right? Um, this is what the sort of UI looks like. You're given an explanation for text classification, and you just select a bunch of words, and you say, I don't think this word should be part of your explanation. And the classifier just uses that information to improve itself. Right? Uh, these are what the results look like. What we did was, if you don't make any changes to the classifier, you get an accuracy something in the 57 58%. We also sat down, students and I, and we went through the data without looking at explanations, trying to do our own sort of engineering to fix this problem. And we were pretty happy because we got about 70% just by looking at the data and fixing all of these problems. Right? But then we sent it to all these Mechanical Turk people who um, knew less machine learning than us, but they had access to the explanations that we didn't look at. And in fact, over multiple rounds, they were able to do, they were able to create classifiers that were better than what we were able to do without looking at explanations. So they were looking at explanations, we were not, and they were able to improve beyond us. So it feels like one of us should have been fired and money should have been used for Mechanical Turk. Okay, and finally, this is some recent results we've been doing on trying to see whether users can use these explanations to predict what the machine learning model would do in the future, right? And so the setup is fairly simple here. You have some data and you have some classifier. You show what the predictions of the classifier is to a user. Um, and you also show it the explanations. And then you take some new data that the user has never seen or the classifier has, has never seen before. And you ask the user to guess what would the machine learning algorithm do on this completely new data, right? It's a pretty difficult problem, uh, I mean, but it sort of gets at what it means to understand something, is being able to predict what it's going to do in the future, right? And the nice thing about this setup is it's pretty easy to evaluate whether the user got it right or wrong, because you can just run the classifier on this new data, again, in a black box manner, and just see how many times the user got it right. So the first thing we did was how often were the user's guesses correct when they tried to predict this uh, for two different setups. And if they had no explanations, they got about 60% um, on this task, six, between 60 and 70% without any explanations. Right? These are two different setups. They got about 60 to 70%. But with explanations, they were able to get more than 90, and in fact, almost 100% for one of the tasks they were able to predict exactly what the classifier was going to do, which I think we were really, really surprised about and pretty happy, in fact. Yeah. But what was also very interesting was not just the fact that these users were really good at predicting what the machine learning models would do, but in fact, they used much less time or effort to able to make this prediction, right? So if they had no explanation, if they just had a bunch of examples, they spent about, you know, 12 to 18 seconds trying to figure out what the machine learning model would do on a new data point. But with explanations, they took like four to six seconds, on average five, um, to figure out what the machine learning model would do in the future, right? So not only are they more accurate, but they spend much less time 
doing so. And that's actually sort of consistent. If you're confused about something, if the task is challenging, you tend to spend more time and you're less accurate, and that kind of gets reflected here. Right. So with that, I hope I've given you enough empirical evidence um, to at least get you excited about the fact that explanations are important. You need to be able to trust machine learning systems. You need to be able to predict what's gonna happen. You need to be able to sort of fix them. And, and sort of our approach to these model agnostic explanations at least seems to be a good direction in which you're able to understand what's happening of, of these really complicated machine learning models, right? Um, so a lot of what I've talked about today is in the paper there with the link to the source code. It's all open source. It's pretty easy to just apply the same thing for whatever machine learning thing that you're using and seeing what explanations are. And I have my contact information. Please get in touch uh, if you have any questions that we don't get to today. So, yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Samir. Um, before we open up to general questions, I have one housekeeping question I'm going to do because I didn't see Windsor here today from the uh, IEEE Computing Society. So if I could see a show of hands and get an idea as to how many of you are IEEE members. Let's just count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10. Thank you. All right. So, um, questions? I see one right here. Actually, two questions. First, you had a chart where you said Lime and you said Lime Global, and I'm not clear about the difference. But the other question is on the, sound, you know, on the wolf discrimination, you showed us how you learned what it was looking at. On the salary discrimination prediction, you did not indicate how you decided what those explanations were. Did you do the same sort of thing of hiding some of the data? Um, okay, so I'll answer the second question first. Um, the short answer is yes, the underlying techniques are very similar. Uh, in general, the idea is to synthesize a lot of synthetic examples, run them to the classifier, and see what effect it has. Uh, in, the, in the salary case, that, that generation was a little bit more focused, I want to say. It wasn't completely random perturbations, uh, but the underlying I idea was basically the same there as well. We sort of generated a lot more data than there already was. Uh, some sort of, what if we change the gender of this person? What, what would the classifier do? Some basic stuff like that. Um, for the first part, uh, can you remind me what the question was again? Oh, yes, yes. Yes, so the idea there was uh, the users are trying to compare two classifiers to see which one is better. And so if we give them just a single explanation for a single decision, that's not sufficient. They want to understand the classifier as a whole. So in the Lime random case, we just selected a random 10 instances and showed them the explanations for those instances um, and based on which they were able to differentiate between the classifier. In the Lime global one, we were trying to find the most representative explanations of this classifier, not just a random 10 one, but sort of more focused search. And that actually had an effect on how much, how more accurate they were in figuring out which classifier. The quick question on, um, on how you generated the uh, sample points for probing the classifier to generate this explanation. Is that manually generated, or did you have an automated process to come up with that? Th that's a good question. We are actually working on a purely automated way of doing it. Uh, right now, it's, we call it just a sort of a perturbation function that takes your instance and just adds some random noise to it. So for images, it was just kind of hiding randomly parts of the image. Uh, it's just a piece of code that the user writes as part of the domain. So if you use this package right now, you would have to write a perturbation function, um, but we are trying to find ways to do that automatically. Yeah. Okay. Hi, the explanation struck me as being very similar to knowing human motivations explaining their behavior. For example, if somebody does something, 
and then later you find out they had a financial motivation or a family motivation or a connection with Russians, then you, right. may, you may understand their tweets. Right. It, it seems very similar. Right, right, right. right. Yes, I, I, that, that's a good point, right? Like by, um, so, so the, the way we think about it is that at this point, you know, machine learning is not as complex as the brain or maybe it's as complex as the current president's brain, but not, not usually. Um, but the point is it's still complex enough that we don't really understand. So if we try to get at exactly every step of why it is doing something, it would be too complicated anyway. What we want is the thing that was most informative for the, for the thing, and then yes, um, some of the similar stuff have been used in sort of psychological research to show that if you just boil the things down, especially when you're teaching something, it's easy to, it's important to simplify things, even if the problem is complex, uh, and then add layers of complexity after that. So yeah, there are definitely interesting connections between this world. Yeah. For like these, uh, Algorithms like Siri or, or one of these ones at Google that is kind of incredibly complex. Um, do you see the applications that you're showing here um, being utilized by them? Or how are they kind of updating their classifiers? Generally speaking, like what's their process? Do they have a team that looks at it from a black box perspective? Or um, I was just kind of wondering what that works like. That, that, that's a good question. I think part of it, um, so yeah, usually they have a bunch of machine learning engineers kind of looking at Accuracy is the main signal combined with few example sort of images, right? Um, but they, they don't do a really good job. I mean, Google actually had this really public example of their sort of image detector, the same sort of thing that I was showing. It was tagging images automatically. So if you use Google Photos right now, it automatically categorizes everything. And a couple of years ago, they had this really terrible situation of a classifier that was tagging all African-American, or at least a bunch of African-American photographs as those of gorillas. Um, and so that's an example where, because they hadn't done their due process in trying to understand exactly what the classifier is doing, it ends up making these really horrible predictions. And stuff like that happens in a very public way for all of these companies. So in fact, um, Carlos is actually now at Apple, and they're looking at ways to use this kind of stuff to ensure that whatever they provide as a service at least doesn't make these kind of horrible mistakes. Right. Yeah. So Samir, I have a question for you. So you're going to the doctor, and you have some problem. And the doctor says, well, I'm going to consult my machine learning right. you know, advisor, whatever it's called, Watson or whatever, because we have some diagnosis. So what question should you ask your doctor? So, I mean, that, that's really, that's a good example that I often use is suppose you go to a neural doctor in, in the future, you may not need a middle group person. Um, and, and the problem is right now you can go to a doctor and say, hey, this is how I'm feeling right now. And the doctor might come to a conclusion that says, well, you only have six more months to live. You have the right to say, well, how did you reach that conclusion, right? Um, and humans are able to do that, and they're trained to do that as well, but machine learning models are not necessarily trained to do something like that. And so these explanations are basically going to be a way for machine learning models to say that, okay, the reason I think of a specific decision was reached was because of blah, 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 blah. Right, so yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, obviously very uh, useful information to have, insights to have for anyone depending upon machine learning or anyone creating machine learning models. Right. So again, uh, Samir, thank you for taking the time to come to talk to us today. We have a couple uh, sort of tokens of appreciation for you. Oh. One is a, a certificate. Oh, thank you. Oh, I didn't sign this one? I'll sign it. I'll sign it for you, it's okay. <laughs> I know your signature, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Second, I had some problems with my printer today. Imagine having problems with a printer after all these years. And the second is just a token gift. I don't know if you drink, but you probably know someone who does. This is some homemade limoncello. Oh, cool. I just made, so. Uh, That's awesome. Thank you so back, much. So hopefully, uh, I've tasted it's a little cool. bit of it. Yeah. came out OK, so. Yeah, 34% alcohol by volume. So, yep. Yeah. And it's got a lot of sugar in it, too, so <laughs> yeah. be careful on that All one. sounds good. Thank so you. So thank you. And then to the audience here, again, thank you for coming. I know a lot of you, this was your first time coming to one of our meetings. We would love to see you at a future meeting. Again, our next meeting will be in September. Um, you'll get an email about it. Um, 
And you know, if you happen to want to make a donation on your way out, I'm sure Lilith and Alan are still in the back there. They'd be happy to take a donation to help keep this organization running. So thank you. And if you have any one-on-one -on -one questions, I'm sure Professor Singh will be here for a few minutes. Thank you again.